So, hi everyone. Um, my great privilege to, to share out of the word a bit of testimony, a bit of my own reflection. And um, you know, it's so nice to be here and know some of your stories, some of our roads recently crossed, some of us have known each other for a while, but to know that what Anna said is true. God takes our lives, and then those moments that we are stretched beyond measure, those times that we are scrunched up and we feel incredibly insignificant, those times we feel as if we've been let to hop downstairs and we're like, oh, what's happening? And last week, Ross, Ross preached on, on, amongst other things, but God's providential, providential grace where you get to step back, and for me in my 40s, to step back and go, wow. Wow, God. This has nothing to do with me. This is everything to do with a God that is good. A God that is great. A God that comes after the one and leaves the 99 the God that has had to forgive me many more times than what I have had to forgive anyone else. And a God that loved me so much and loves you so much. And oh, if I can encourage you, go to Bible school, start there. But delve into this word as if it's your life source. As if without it you will die you might, and allow it to do its work by transforming you. So, I've got a sermon that's it's actually just a hot matter. Um, I spoke twice on the scripture, and to be very honest, I don't know what's going to jump out this evening, but I'm going to read 1 Peter 2 to you. Um, 1 Peter 1 paints the picture of our salvation, how profound it is, how transformational it is, how precious it is, and that it's all caught up in this man called Christ that we spoke about. It's a miracle. It is God that is loving and gracious and that had a plan since the beginning of time and before time to meet us and walk in relationship with us. And here he reveals himself to us in flesh and blood in the man Christ. And he wants to restore what the enemy came to steal, his constant presence in our lives, the fellowship we should be having, the authority we have to rule and reign, and our roles as priests in this land. So, that's the picture. And then we get to 1 Peter 2, and it says, so put away all malice. This is if you've received this Christ. If you've said, I believe in Jesus and he is my Lord. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. I see here a very clear instruction. We sometimes walk through life as if... um, it's kind of difficult to understand what God's asking of us. Oh, what's God wanting from me now, today? Where should I go? With who should I share a prophetic word? We want to make it very spiritual, not a bad thing, beautiful desire. But the first things first, put away malice. What's malice? None of you have ever felt malice. Malice is when that person makes you mad, so mad 
that you want them to hurt. You want them to feel pain and suffer. Intentionally thinking and wanting bad for someone else. Malice. But you guys are way too holy and you've put that away. <laughs> and then put away deceit. Deceit is a bit more subtle than just putting away being a liar. Hey? Deceit is somehow more subtle. I shared the other day, I am prone to deceit because I can read a room. You mustn't look so worried, Natalie. I'm really trying to kick the habit. <laughs> Natalie's like, oh. <laughs> um, but deceit is so subtle. It's just like, Almost telling the truth. Almost giving the whole story. God says, put that away. Because deceit often comes, in my case, from wanting to self-preserve. Wanting to keep your reputation. Wanting people to believe something of you that's maybe a bit more rosy than what the raw, ugly truth is. Deceit is a subtle thing. Put away hypocrisy. Put away those masks. Those ones we put on just before we walk in here. We've just yelled at our children or thought a nasty thing about the guy that took the parking in front of me. Um, just feeling very depressed. And then I walk in here, I'm like, oh, Jesus loves you. <laughs> hypocrisy. Or walking in here standing here and going, oh, hitting my children too hard at home, kicking my dog, living a two-faced life. God says he wants nothing of it. Put it away. Envy. Envy is a nasty thing. Envy is wanting what others have, or the worst version of that, is wanting what you perceive someone else has. I had a very amazing conversation with a dear friend of mine two days ago. And um, we were talking about she is unmarried, my age. And we said how this thing segregates the church. Because we perceive the single life looking as if you've got so much freedom, so much more rights to your own time and your own, and something about it looks amazing. But for me to envy my friend for her freedom and the way she can spend her own money and even the way she can serve the Lord and pursue her healing makes me automatically keep parts of my life away from her. It brings distance. It makes that she can't share certain things with me. And in the same way, if she looks at me and goes, what a lovely picture, married, three children. If that is the resounding thing in our hearts, what we don't have and how we perceive their things to be great, Immediately there's a chasm and there's no room for that chasm in the body of Christ. Put it away. And it all begins with a thought that runs to the heart and we entertain it. And before you get it, somebody walks into a room and you don't know why, you just want to go, oh. He got the job I wanted. He has the favor that I wished I had. I'm back at the, the ranch I shared the other day. My husband and I have a wonderful marriage now, but we had such a tough marriage when we were young. We had to pray for daily grace to just cling to each other and not, I don't know, luckily we went in and we said, 
running away from each other is not an option. But to find joy. And I remember that irony of going, I can't share with everyone how difficult it is to be married. But then I get to people, my dearest friends, and they, they have this picture, and I can't share with them how difficult this is for me this season of my life, because I know all they want is what I have. So it left me very lonely at times. Ten years where some of my nearest and my dearest friends couldn't be part of my journey because they held something of envy that I could feel. That's the one way. And the other way, I made my heart hard because I was like, oh, if you only knew how hard it was. Why weren't you there for me? You know, it plays both ways. Envy. Be careful what you see someone else has that you perceive they have and you wish for it. And then, slander. Slander is a nasty thing. Slander is the way we often deal with our frustration. Somebody bugs me a little bit. I'm wondering, are they right? I'm wrong. I find Danny. I say, oh, Danny. Did you see what he, oh, I don't know. I, was it really wrong? And I end up with this very, we can make it very righteous and very seeking God's heart in church circles. And then we get onto Instagram or whatever, and then we just slay people and slander them straightforward because we're, we're protected by the screen. But what happens is we break trust. We break relationship. And I said the other day, it reminded me of, it reminds me of the seasons that I've fallen into the trap of slander, of speaking badly behind someone's back about them. When I'm so frustrated, it's almost as irritation that builds up and then if I just have a little frustrating let some of my frustration out in a conversation I was like oh okay I feel better I never end up resolving the thing that frustrates me and I said it reminded me of my tire that my husband since I last mentioned it in a sermon context got our wheel fixed but we had a slow puncture and every time I don't want to drive his car he's just like remember to just quickly go and pump the wheel up and we tend to do that in our church communities, in our friendship circles, even in our marriages. We let out these little spots of frustration, and then we quickly, we feel a little bit puffed up and as if we can drive again. But eventually, that thing will pop. That tire will leave you in a very difficult position next to the R300. We need to get to the root. And what slander does, and we don't deal and just get the new tire, is the equivalent of going to the situation, either sorting it out with the person that you have concerns about, but more than likely, God's going to call you to your knees. I heard somewhere this week, somebody said, oh, who was it? I think it was this morning. Somebody said, if you... Talk to other people about others. If you slander, you'll grow to hate people. But if you talk, talk to God honestly about other people, you'll grow to love them. Let's turn our conversations and those frustrations to the one who loves the people around you. And there we see very practically putting away of these things. And I said, if you put away malice, evil intent, that way you get so angry, you want bad things to happen to people. Where you put away deceit, half-truths, pretending to be something you're not in hypocrisy. If we had 
people that wanted the best for other people. I tell my children to enjoy your friends getting a new toy or their success makes life double as nice for you. Who's ever gone like your buddy gets a new car and you're like, felt that joy in your heart as if it was your own? That's godliness. Move towards that. Allow God, when it's not like that, to go, Lord, my buddy got a new car. And I felt envious and malicious and haha about it. But you say, God, that's not your way. Transform my heart. And then you go back to that buddy and you say, take me for a spin. And you action that which is precious to you. That which you choose. So, a community where we celebrate each other. Where we have no deceit. So we can trust our brothers and sisters around us. Where we are 100% honest about who we are and what we are. And we take off those masks. Where we enjoy what others have for their sake. And where we know when we walk out of a room, the only words that will be spoken will be words of honor. Can we imagine a community that does that? And then can we imagine, it feels like these almost higher grade heart issues God is addressing. Can you imagine the freedom that comes out of a community like that? Because who wants to come and confess their dark secrets to people that are going to shame them and skin it about them afterwards? Who wants to come serve God in freedom and liberty and dance in the church? If you know Sonny at the back there is so jealous of your ability to do whatever. If we sort these things out. It'll invite a community, a space where there is freedom. A freedom as it continues to be part of something that God ordained. So, before I carry on, and I want you to sit and just ponder how beautiful it could be. To be part of something like that. And I want to tell you that God ordained something just like that. And Matthew 16 is the first time Jesus speaks of this space. And it says, he said to Peter now, you are, who do you say I am? And he says, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And then he says, and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Here, Jesus declares something unbelievably profound. In Ephesians, he would call it a profound mystery. We know the Old Testament and the Torah is all about one nation. They are used, they are loved by God, but they are used to demonstrate and teach us God's heart and God's ways. They are told that they are an example. And when we get to prophecies, we come to places where we hear whispers of this king, this savior, this messiah that will be like no other. But there are some other, un, in those days, unimaginable concepts being shared. And here Jesus announces it. At his birth, something starts to happen. He raises up 12 men. Minus one, plus one again. He 
leaves and goes and sits at the right hand of God. And he sends out the Holy Spirit. And the church of Christ is born. And we are in an era where God says, I died for you, Stefan. But I died for the church. I died for you to be part of a family. I died for you to be called my nation, my people, my holy priesthood. I once again died for a nation. I gave my life for a nation. And I'm calling a nation to me. The word church is ecclesia, the called out ones, or an assembly. The word has also got connections with military language, but it says it's, it's not the small regiment or the snipers or the this or the that, I don't know, army language. But they say it's not the little, it's not a little bit. So it's not just the people that get ordained as pastors. It's not just the evangelists that are brave enough to go out to Tiger Valley and share the gospel. It's everyone with the varied gifts with a very grace on their life that responded to the saving message of Jesus Christ with a resounding yes. The church, the called out ones. We see a comparison and so worth it this week to go and look again. We see the Israelites were the first to be called out. Out of Egypt where they were enslaved. When you are a slave, you do not have a name. You don't have authority. You don't own land. You don't have an identity. We know very well Pharaoh didn't allow them time off to celebrate or go and sacrifice to their God. But you are worked to the bone. Before you knew Christ, you were enslaved. You worked to your bones. What am messing up my sayings? You worked, you worked hard because you were your only hope. Your finances was your only hope. Your intellect was your only hope. Your family name was your only hope. This world in all its darkness was an Terrifyingly, as it might seem, was your only hope. And in that moment when you went from darkness into light, to Pete, oh, 1 Peter 2 would continue to say, you started building your life and depending on something new. A cornerstone. A cornerstone that was perfectly positioned by a loving all-powerful, all-knowing God. A stone that was laid in a way that every other stone that would be laid alongside it to form this building would be perfectly aligned, would be perfectly safe and stable, would have great purpose and a place of honor. But we tend to forget. We tend to forget that as the Israelites were redeemed and taken away at great cost and with great commotion of the ten plagues. How often in the wilderness and how quickly in the wilderness did they say, oh, did God just lead us out here to be enslaved again? Did he just lead me out here to die? Jesus led you out of Egypt, out of death. And he's asking you to align again. And he's asking you to go and look what is your cornerstone. What are you building your life on? 
Tim Keller speaks of a woman he knows that works at an Ivy League university. And she said to him, she said, all these kids come and they're all their A, straight A students. But not everyone stays a straight A student when you get to the best of the best at a university that pushes you to your fullest potential. And she says, within months, most of them come to sit on my chair. And they fall apart because they have built their identity on being smart. What are you building your identity on? Are you building it on the relationship you're in? Are you building it on how smart you are, how financially stable you are on, on what you can do for God? Or is what you are building your life on Christ and Christ alone? So it was in Ephesians 5 that I said I got to it and it was that beautiful scripture about husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his, his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. I sat with this. I sat with this thing God says is a mystery and it's profound. Scripture says. And it's a mystery that we have to discover how Christ loves the church. I said this morning, you can buy me chocolates, you can flatter me. If you do not love my children, if you don't like my children, if your eyes don't light up when they enter a room, all the chocolates, and I love chocolates, in the world will mean very little. I will struggle to believe that you love me and that you're invested in me if you don't love them. I want to tell you, if you are a believer in this house, God says, his eyes light up when you enter his presence. He is excited about you. And he, I should imagine, struggles when others do not recognize how precious you are to him. And then not even to mention how precious we are when we gather together. God has an invited me personally to go and sit and ask God why he loves this church, how he loves this church, and then to go, where have I failed? Where have I gotten so hurt and offended that my heart, we said this evening, with the worship, it's all about the heart, where my heart has maybe hardened towards this thing God says he loves, his church. And then to ask myself, 
how do I participate? Because I, according to one Peter, am a living stone, aligning myself with this beautiful cornerstone. What does that look like? What does that feel like? And the picture I got was, we are, there's this beautiful building being built. And there's these rocks lying around, these stones. And very conveniently, some of us are just rolling away to the side. We're just close enough. We like seeing what's happening. We like it even more to point out when things look a bit skew as if they're not going to work. But some of us haven't surrendered ourselves to being built into that wall. Some of us are just lying really close by. But what God says He only says in Corinthians that you are a temple of God. That's beautiful. Also just something we can sit and gape at and think about for days. But in every other place, God says his presence is amongst his people. He reveals his presence to the world through his ecclesia. His assembly, his gathered ones. If you believe you can do Christianity on your own, over a TV screen, you are mistaken. In, um, Anna and I chatted about this, but in C.S. Lewis's book, Four Loves, there's a chapter on friendship. And C.S. Lewis speaks about his one friend passing away. You'll have to help me. I can't remember the friend's name, but let's call him John. John passes away. And they were a group of friends. And he says, the day he lost his friend, John, he didn't just lose John. He lost his friend's Charles reaction to John's jokes. He lost not just his friend to death, but he lost the aspects of his other's friends that came to life, that came to the fore when they were around his friend. We reveal to one another not just varying aspects of each other's personalities, of God's design in us. But we reveal our revelation of who God is to one another. No man, no woman, if they do run from them, can fully understand and say they have the whole truth underfoot. We see in part, scripture says so. It is very dangerous if we believe only two or three people can stand up here and they have the whole truth. I need you more than what you need me to reveal God's character. God in action. God's goodness to me. We need each other. And the image of us being built up as this beautiful building also makes a very clear image. If you are a stone that's been edged in, there are stones beneath you. Stones that you depend on. If they crumble, you tumble. Can be my little slogan. They crumble, you stumble. I've been wrestling with that the last while. We don't do dependency. Right? We all know it's unhealthy in relationships and, and, and. However, we do interdependency. 
subtle difference, I suppose. I think where the world has made such a negative con connotation to be dependent on anyone else is where the cornerstone is in Christ. Very dangerous to get dependent on people whose cornerstone is in Christ. You will be disappointed because their foundation is going to crumble, your foundation is going to crumble. But if we are interdependent, it means that there are people that we have stood, sat on, trusted on, to stay nestled into this wall so that we can form part of this glorious process. And it means that it's okay, those that have dropped the ball, that have fallen out of the wall, that you feel a little bit unstable. I just want you to remember who the builder is. He is in control. However, there are also people that are going to be built on top of your journey with God. Your faith journey. There are people that are going to depend on you to not take your salvation lightly. To Every day, remind yourself how precious this Christ is. So that you do not lose sight or substitute your cornerstone for anything else but him. Can you live with that responsibility? Because it is a responsibility. It's a great honor. But that's tension and often that either my weakness causing someone else to stumble or somebody else's weakness causing me to stumble has made us excuse being part of this war. But I suspect if I look and I reflect on how faithful God is, that once you are nestled in, he is a lot more committed to you staying in place than what you can ever imagine. Our trust needs to be on him. Okay. Lost where I was in my scripture. Okay. Put away malice. Desire pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. God is inviting us to grow up. I said this morning, if you ask me what God's asking the body of Christ, he's going, what I do sometimes, where's the adult in the room? And you're like, oh, it's me. <laughs> but there's a process. When you got saved, God calls you. So if you are a newly committed Christian, you need support. You need to depend on others more heavily. You need to drink the scripture as if your life depends on it. You need to know Jesus and spend time in the gospels very practically. You need to come to church on Sundays and go to life group on Wednesdays. Because you are a baby. My son doesn't like it. Sometimes he plays it to his advantage. But few of us like being called babies. I wish I was still a baby. But God says there's a growing up that needs to happen. But that will only happen if you have tasted. That's what scripture says. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. They say with children, I got nieces here, so I need to be careful what I say. But sometimes I worry because selfishness is like something I just don't have, a, like a, like it, it upsets me. Um, but there is a season where a young child is so dependent and so self-focused. And I've had to teach myself 
that that is a good thing. There is a season of your life that you need to be nurtured, a season where you need to feel safe, a season where you need to know and hear you are special and that you, are, you have a family name and that you belong. And that's where God starts with spiritual babies. And he starts in houses where there's a mom and a dad and he establishes identity and security. And if that thing is not established in you, make work of it. In the natural and in the spiritual. We're going to get to that now. And from that place where you know you are secure, you know God calls you beautiful things, you will grow and flourish. We as mature, older, granny Christians need to be aware that there are needs young believers have and we must be willing like I am sometimes, I was like, must I make the meal again? Karin Silvia challenged me this week on just, like, being a mommy is making food, so you might as well enjoy it, hey? There are things that we have to do if we want to see younger believers grow in maturity. And there's a season of doting and loving and caring and protecting that we have to man up to. Okay, Okay. so we've come to this Christ, the living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, living stones, God says, you are like Christ. How many of us relate to God as if he stayed in that tomb? How many of us live lives as if he's gone up but he's not coming back. God is inviting us to remember that he is living and very active in your life. He has that slinky in his hands. There's providential grace being played out in every believer's life that is so profound and speaks of such a loving God. I shared a story, sorry if I'm repeating stuff, about my mom two weeks ago. And just in the last three weeks, seeing the fullness of providential grace, and then having the grace to go, but what does that mean for me? To see that even though our life ebbs and flows and we go through challenges and we get tested and we have great, wonderful moments of ecstasy of God's presence and his blessings and we have moments like Paul speaks of seasons I have plenty and seasons I've got nothing. That's life. But he is living and intricately involved and he's busy working out your story for his glory. Another slogan we can use. For his glory. Because he loves you. Okay. He is living. Live as if he is living. And remember that he was rejected by men. In the sight of God. But, um, but in the sight of God chosen. How many of us here have said. Make me more like Jesus. Thank you Tanya. Okay, Tanya and I want to be more like Jesus. The rest of you, I felt your hands going up in here. Thank you. Do you know what you're saying yes to? Being rejected by man and living to be delighted in by God and everything that entails. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, for it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. The 
that thing, I've had some conversations with some of you here. If Christ is your cornerstone, you won't struggle with shame. So often I have just like gone my, my scriptures, Proverbs 3, commit your ways to the Lord and he will direct your path. And I just sort of try and take the next step of obedience. And then I'm going like, oh, Lord, with all this brokenness and this messiness of who I am, just trying to be obedient, somewhere it feels as if I'm going to hit my, my nose against a brick wall kind of thing because this is almost, it's in one way so full of grace and so liberating to just have that mentality of one step at a time. But, but this is also kind of daring because people think I'm crazy for doing certain things, living so radically for Jesus. And then God so often said to me, in my weakest moments, he will preserve my name for his name's sake. He will not put you to shame. I have tested God on this. Even when I've done a be been in a situation where I've just had to repent and say, Lord, I have misaligned, I've missed it. But you say, I am yours. You redeem me. You forgive me. Put my, remind me my cornerstone. Put it in me in place again. And then he says, for my name's sake, I will not put you to shame. If you are constantly struggling with shame, go and re-evaluate your cornerstone. And if you go to that cornerstone and it is Jesus, then you turn around to that enemy and you say, you will stop. Because I can give you a letter, a sign letter that you will not be put to shame. It's my life experience. And it's many believers that I know's experience. You will not be put to shame. Okay, keeping an eye on the time. Okay, the stone that builders reject has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Very tricky thing that Peter chats about here. Hey? As they were destined to do. Did he choose you? Did you choose him? Are some people not chosen? I'll leave that for you. But you are a chosen race. You don't have to worry. You are a chosen race. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people for his own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. What is God saying when he says all those nice things about you? Whoop. Number one, God calls out. What does that look like? My props that Nicole almost gave away. He calls out and he says, Yana. Now, Yana has a choice, always, because he is gracious. Or I can say, Yana, come here. <laughs> there was a calling out and there is a response <laughs> there's an acting out of saying I will remove myself and separate myself actually deal van die gepeepel meer nie sorry I made it this morning and people also thought it was very funny. And then God says, Yana, when he calls you out, <laughs> you are royal. It's pretty. Kids church. Kids church. It's, that's where I come from. That's what you always get from me. And he dresses you and gives you identity as a priest. <laughs> this, and she's a bit warmer. You are made 
to stand out. If she was sitting there, I'll keep it balanced, Dave. Copy still up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, then we put it on top. Um, Jana, I very clearly felt the Lord show me I must make this as practical as possible. When you walk into a room in the spiritual realm, don't laugh at her. Where's this all this envy slander? You must take a photo then as well. Um, <laughs> this is very practically what God sees is someone dressed, made pure, called out. Royalty. You have authority. We need to remind the church of Christ you have authority. When you speak, the heavens hear. When you stand up against that sin in your life, the enemy must listen. When you intercede for your friends, things start happening because there's power and authority in your words and in your actions. And then there's a priestly garment placed on you. <laughs> okay, Yana, you can sit. You all will remember Yana forever. Thank you, Yana. A priestly garment, a priestly role. What did priests do? Their lives were dedicated to that which is sacred. God's presence was their main focus. And leading people into holiness. What are you doing with your life? Are you keeping what is sacred, sacred? Are you treating this word that God says he protects, that he gave us through his spirit with honor? Are you ministering it to others? This is not meant to be ministered only on Sundays from one person. It should be in your hearts and in your lips and constantly wherever you're going, pouring out of you. Are you remembering the sacraments? Remembering to break bread and drink wine in remembrance of what Christ did? And are you doing it with fellow believers, with your families? Are you aware that this temple, but this temple that we are forming together where God says his presence dwells, are you keeping it clean? A priestly responsibility. But with this, with this beautiful list of beautiful titles that define our identity, God is saying, you belong. You got saved into a family, into an order. He says you are part of something greater. I'm just watching trailers of the Sound of Freedom movie about trafficking. So uncertain whether to watch it, but there's a man's story. And something about it should speak to every Christian heart of living lives for the other, for the weak. Stepping out, not in our own strength, but in God's strength. God says he honors us. How bizarre, guys. God places a crown on your head. He anoints you as a priestly order. He places you in a position of service. It's really one of the biggest cries of our hearts is, Lord, do I have anything to add? Something of value to give this world? And God says you do. 
You have the truth to share. You are called to rule and reign. You are meant to be ministers of peace and joy and hope. And God says something this world wants to lie to you about. You are pure. Purity is a gift from God to every child. And now you're already going, all the accusers' voices are coming to you. Ah, oh, Melissa, you don't know what I did last summer. I suspect I do. He says that's not who you are. He says, repent. Not because you are haha and because what you did is unthinkable. Uh uh. He says, turn back to me and walk out who you are. Be who I called you to be. And become deeply aware of this grace he pours upon your life. Not to be perfect in the now and here in this flesh. But the grace he pours out to you. To every time. Turn back. Turn back. Turn back. You will never find a God that rejects you. And you will never be disappointed. He will take you back. Just don't stop turning back to him. Because he knows who you are. There came a word this morning from Robert where he said that woman that was brought by the men and accused of being adulterous that was thrown in front of Jesus. And they sort of called out what is the legal thing to do here. And Robert pointed out when he shared the word so clearly, those men are like the enemy. They don't care about that woman. They were just trying to catch Jesus out. And every time you get accused, it's the enemy actually accusing Christ. And then your honor is to stand up and say, no, that's not who he said I am. Okay. He says we are God's people. I love, I'm going to end here. Um, Exodus 33, Moses. If Israelites have come out of Egypt. They panicked when the Egyptians were coming for them. The sea opened in front of them. They came through. They're putting up a tent. In my head, it's quite clear that Moses is busy with God. I'm seeing lightning and clouds and a big commotion. And they're there, and they turn to their priestly order, Aaron, and they somehow convince him to build or to make a calf, right? Do I have the story right? Yes. Crazy. Ten plagues, open the oceans, and then they do that. And Moses comes back and he has to beg for their lives. And this is what he prays. He says, or his intercession, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know who you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways. When Christ revealed, when Holy Spirit revealed Christ to you, you received favor. And our humble response is, God, teach me your ways. Because there's a way of life that leads to life. That I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. God, might I know you. I've got this favor now. I don't know why you chose me. Why did I choose Yana out of the whole crowd? I don't know. God knows why he chose you, though. And then you respond, I want to know you. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he goes into that priestly order. And he said, my presence 
will go with you and I will give you rest. I have set you free from Egypt. In my presence you will have rest. Are you a people of rest? And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Are we going about our Christian walk satisfied being without his presence? And do we realize that his presence manifests most powerfully when we are together? For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us that we are distinct? I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth. This is my prayer for us. For us, Shalfa Durbanville, but for us, the body throughout the world. Might we become distinct again? Might we stand out? Might we be get comfortable that we are rejected by man? but greatly loved and accepted by God. What does that look like? It means when you go to New York and you say your Christian values go, women, God loves women, so we're all for women, yes. And we love the poor and we love everyone that's different and we embrace them. New York, I'm grossly generalizing, are going, we like you. But you dare mention that marriage is sacred and you can't abort a baby because it's a life and you are rejected. You go to the Middle East and you say, sex only in marriage, sanctity of life. But then you tell them, we turn the other cheek and we forgive our enemies. They love aspects of us, but they reject if you are living a life where everyone's accepting you, then I invite you to align yourself with the word again. Because we are living stones who identify and conform to the image of one that was rejected. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time together. I thank you, Lord, that your word is living and that there's an invitation again this evening, Lord, to align ourselves with your truth, with Jesus Christ, our cornerstone. And we thank you, Lord, that there is such blessing in our identity, that the God who created the heavens and the earth would call us royal, a priesthood, his people. And we thank you, Lord, that you remind us this evening through your spirit who we are and what we are invited to. May we love what you love. Would you give us a renewed hope and vision for the church and the era we are in? Would you restore hearts that are broken? because they were hurt in places they were meant to be protected, because they were slandered in a place where they should have been honored, where there was malice instead of a celebration, where we wanted what others had instead of delighting in what they had and trusting you who is just and kind and whose eye is on his beloved, each one of us. So, Father, we thank you for this week. We thank you that you continue to speak to us. And we thank you for your presence here this evening. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, everyone's welcome to go grab a cup of coffee and remember that you are called to this beautiful fellowship but if there's anyone here and you went, oh goodness, there's a building, there's a body, there's stones, what's this about? But there's a man that takes people from darkness into light. 
And he wants to give life to anyone that responds to that message and wants to make him Lord of their lives, who wants to say, I want to make him my cornerstone. If there's anyone like that here, a few of us will be standing here. This is your moment. You will never regret making Christ your cornerstone. You will never regret aligning yourself with this kind, gracious, all-knowing, omnipotent God. And your life will be marked by holiness and purity. Not because you are, but because he said he died for you and took the price of your shame. So if there's anyone like that, I'll be standing here. Please come and pray. Just come ask questions. And I'd love to introduce you to the man, Christ. Enjoy the evening.